as we continue to look at statements that have kind of uh, worked their way into Christianity, which don't necessarily line up with what the Bible teaches, uh, we're going to look at one that sometimes I think people use just kind of jokingly, um, while at the same time some people use it seriously. Uh, personally, for every time that I've heard it be being used in jest or as a joke, I've heard someone else say it with passion and commitment and uh, thinking or believing it to be true. And so the statement that we're going to ask, does the Bible really say that, about this morning is this. Don't pray for patience because God will put you in a situation to make you learn patience. So this idea or this statement basically just says, hey, don't pray for patience because life will get harder if you do. Now, the Bible does not tell us to not pray for patience. In fact, the Bible presents patience as, as great and as necessary, uh, that it is beneficial for us and really uh, a necessity for us if we're going to live out our faith in Christ. Now this morning, before we jump into looking at patience, which is what we're going to spend the majority of our time looking at, I want to kind of look at the mentality behind that statement. Because it's a mentality that says, if I don't want blank, or if I don't want to experience blank, or if I don't want to uh, have to deal with whatever comes with whatever this characteristic or attribute is, here, patience, if I just don't ask God for it, then God won't do anything about it then God will just kind of keep that out of my life. And God will kind of keep his fingers off of that spot or off of that area in my life. It's a mindset that says, I am the only one responsible for my spiritual growth. Guess what? We are not. Our spiritual growth, yes, part of it is dependent on us and our desire to walk with God, follow God, obey God, submit, surrender to God. But even more so than our desire to grow spiritually, is God's desire for us to grow spiritually. God's desire for us to grow mature spiritually far exceeds our own. We can be timid and scared and selfish and, and just sinful. And God is none of those things. We can grow content and complacent with where we are spiritually. And God just wants to draw us closer to himself. That we would know him greater and love him more. God's work in our lives to grow us spiritually and his desire to grow us spiritually far outperforms and outshines our own effort and desire. Know this, as God desires to work in our life to draw us closer to himself, God does not need our permission to do so. God does not need my permission to work in my life or to point out sin or to point out weaknesses and then work to make those stronger. God does not need my permission that if he looks at my life, he's all right, we've worked on greed and we've worked on pride and worked on selfishness. Now let's work on patience. He doesn't need me to give him two thumbs up and say, okay, God, I'm ready. Take Job, for instance. When we are introduced to Job, in the book of Job, we are told that he is a righteous man, uh, blameless and upright, who feared God and turned away from evil. This doesn't mean that he's perfect, but it means just kind of the, the pursuit, the direction of his life was focused on honoring and glorifying God. It even tells us that he offered sacrifices for his kids just in case they sinned against God in their hearts. Well, in Job chapter 1, verse 8, we are told that um, angels and others come and present themselves before God. And in this grouping, Satan comes. And as Satan comes, Satan is not the one that brings up Job's name. God is. In fact, in Job 1.8, God says, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? I would be willing to bet that Job did not pray for this to happen. 
I would be willing to bet that Job did not fold his hands and bow his head and said, God, I want my life to become absolutely miserable for the next couple of days, weeks, months, and you to put me through the hardest stuff that I could imagine. Probably was not Job's prayer. And God did not come to Job and say, hey buddy, uh, are you ready or is it okay if I put you through this kind of hell on earth, for lack of a better description, to ultimately show you that I'm good and loving and gracious and kind? Oh, you're not? Okay, well we'll figure something else out. That did not happen. God said, I want to work in Job's life to show how incredible and great and gracious and good and powerful I am. Understand that God does what God does because God is God and we are not. God is God. He is in control. He is sovereign. He is powerful. God knows what is best for us much better than we know ourselves. And God will work situations in our life, even situations that are uncomfortable, ultimately to draw us to himself. God will work in our lives, and sometimes we don't understand why we are going through what we are going through, but know that God works all things for His glory and for our good. For God works for good. For those who love Him are called according to His purposes. God works good in our life. He wants us to know Him and love Him and trust Him. And sometimes that means walking through difficulties. But God works these things for the purpose of us knowing and loving and trusting Him more. And he does not need our permission to do so. And let me just say this, praise God that he doesn't need our permission to do so. If he did, one, he wouldn't be God. Two, we would be worse off because if God said, hey, do you want to walk through this hard time? When you come out on the end, your faith is going to be refined, purer than gold. We would probably say, nah, God, I'm good. But according to his grace, he works and he molds and he shapes and we come out better for it. All right, now let's talk about patience. Statements like the the statement we're looking at today, don't pray for patience, kind of like a Bon Jovi song has given patience a bad name. Patience is a good and necessary thing. So let's start by kind of developing just a common definition for patience. Patience is the endurance of difficulties, either in relationships or situations, with grace, hope, and love instead of anger, frustration, or despair. Understand, patience is not natural, and patience is not necessarily easy. What is natural is getting frustrated. What is natural is impatience. What is natural is us getting angry. What is natural is for us to give up hope because things have gotten difficult or because things have gotten hard. What is natural is for us to kind of throw people off because they're too difficult to deal with, and we don't want to be patient with them. But God calls us to be patient. And look, patience isn't just kind of gritting our teeth and getting through it. Patience is to responding to those hard times, not with just endurance, but also with love and grace and hope. It's loving that person who is difficult, even though they're difficult. It's loving that person who has sinned against you and hurt you time and time again by forgiving them and continuing to love them. Patience is a a good thing that God has called us to. In fact, patience should be prayed for because patience is necessary for us to live lives that glorify God. Patience is a necessity in the life of the believer. So this morning what we're going to do is we're going to run through quickly five reasons why patience is necessary. So there's going to be a lot of verses popping up on the screen. So I would encourage you to jot them down, take note. Uh, If you don't like taking notes because you know I'm just going to throw this paper away, just as a plug for our app, if you download the Farmstead app, there's a spot for notes in there. uh, And then you can just save that or email those notes to yourself, save them so you can keep them for future reference if that's something that you're interested in. All right, first point. For us, patience is one of God's most important attributes so when we talk about the attributes of God we're talking about things that are true of God that's an attribute something that is true of God 
When we talk about God's attributes, man, there's a lot that we can talk about. God is love. That's an attribute of God. God is holy and righteous and just. Those are attributes of God. God is all-knowing. God is omnipresent. God is omniscient. Those are things that are true about God. And all of the attributes of God are, are worthy to be studied. In fact, I would encourage any of you, if you have never studied the attributes of God, a great book to start with called Knowledge of the Holy by A.W. Tozer. And it just goes through just some of the attributes of God. And as we learn more of who God is, it helps us to love and trust and follow God even more. But as we look at the attributes, all of them are worthy, all of them are good, but practically for us, one of the most important attributes is God's patience. Here's why I say that. In the New Testament, often when we see the New Testament talk about God's patience, not our patience, but God's patience, it is linked with the gospel. Let me give you a few verses. Romans 2, 4. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God is meant to lead you to repentance? 1 Timothy 1, 16 says this. But I received mercy for this reason, this is Paul talking, that in me, as the foremost, kind of the chief of sinners, is what he's referring to himself there, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. 2 Peter 3.15 And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as your brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. The reason why we have an opportunity to respond to God's grace is because of God's patience. Look, we are all sinners. We have all fallen short of God's standard. We have all broken God's commandments. The very first time we broke God's commandments, we were worthy of punishment. Instantly worthy of punishment. If your child does something wrong, if they talk back to you, do you wait a week and a half to get on to them? No, you get on to them right then. If a cop pulls you over for speeding, is he going to wait a month to give you a ticket? No, he's going to give you one right then. When we sin, we deserve God's justice and God's punishment instantaneously. As we grow up, every time we sin, we deserve God's judgment and God's punish instantaneously. The first time we hear the gospel, if we do not respond in grace and faith and repentance, then we don't deserve, we didn't deserve the first time, but we definitely don't deserve a second. But in our context, we get multiple opportunities to hear the gospel. The reason is because God is patient. If it weren't for God's patience, we would never get the opportunity to experience His grace. If it weren't for God's patience, then the first time we sin, we would get punished. And that punishment is eternal. If it weren't for God's patience, the first time we did not respond to the gospel, it would be over. But God is patient. God waits. He bears with us. He uh, bears even our, our sins and our imperfections, seeing it, despising our sin, but, but still loving us and giving us opportunities to respond to His grace. If it weren't for God's patience, we would never experience his mercy and his love and the grace shown to us through the cross of Christ. Now, as Christians, we understand that part of our goal is to strive to be like our father. If our father is patient, then guess what? What should we strive to be? You can answer out loud. Patient. If God is patient, then we should strive to be patient. Look, if God is loving, we should strive to be loving. If God is compassionate, we should strive to be compassionate. If God is patient, which He is, thankfully, we should strive to be patient. Next point. Patience is part of spiritual maturity for the believer. So as we grow and mature spiritually, there are... There are characteristics that, that kind of uh, begin to show forth in our life. The Bible calls some of these characteristics the fruit of the Spirit. Let's look at the fruit of the Spirit real fast. Galatians 5.22 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Say it out loud with me. Patience, kindness, goodness, 
faithfulness. We're going to walk with God. Guess what should be showing in our life? Patience. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 says this. I love this passage. It's a, uh, as Paul's writing this letter to the Colossians, this is a prayer that he prays for them. He says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. So Paul says, look, I'm praying for you that you are walking or living in a way that pleases God, a way that is worthy of who God is. And he says, how did we do this? We bear fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Patience, if we are going to live a life worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, it requires patience. If we are going to walk with God, patience is a necessity. You cannot divorce or separate walking with God and loving God from having patience. Now, when we look at the fruit of the Spirit, oftentimes we pray for these things in our lives. We pray for love, that God would help us to love others as He has called us to. We pray for joy, that God would help us have joy in Him even in hard situations. The same as peace, that God would give us peace and direction and leadership in what we are walking through. We pray for kindness, that God would help us to be kind towards others. Goodness, that God would help us to live out righteously. Faithfulness, that God would help us to to be faithful to Him and follow Him and love Him and serve Him. Then why would we not pray for patience as well? God's desire for us to grow spiritually, to live a life that glorifies Him, requires for us to have patience. If we are going to grow spiritually, patience is going to be part of our life. It is a necessity. So why is patience such a necessity, or why is it so important for us? One, so this is still part of our five, uh, but one, patience is needed for us to love and forgive others. God has called us to love other people. He has. He's called us to love other people as Christ has loved us. Man, that's a a, a high calling. Because the love that Christ has loved us with is is insurmountable. It's, It's a perfect love. And God has called us to love others the best that we can. To love others requires patience. You want to know why? Because sometimes we're hard to love. None of us are perfect. None of us gets everything right. We step on each other's toes. We frustrate each other. Sometimes we get stuck in our sin, and we just kind of let that impact our relationships, and we can be hard to love. So if we're going to love each other, we have to be patient with each other, knowing that God is sanctifying us, knowing that God is working in our life, knowing that God is is shaping us and molding us and getting rid of the the spots that he doesn't like and he is at work in all of our lives and sometimes it takes us maybe a little bit longer to learn something than it takes for someone else and if we're going to love each other it requires patience Ephesians 4 32 says with all humility and gentleness with patience bearing one another in love We're going to bear one another, bear with one another in love. It requires humility, it requires gentleness, and it requires patience. If we are going to be a church that loves each other, in the midst of all of our imperfections, we have to be patient with each other. But not just for loving each other, but also forgiving one another. Well, sorry, I jumped ahead of myself. If we are not patient with people... We will never genuinely love them. If we are not patient with each other, then we cannot love each other. Not the love that God has shown us. Look, even now, after I've accepted Christ, God still is incredibly patient with me. Because I'm still not perfect. 
There's still things that I mess up. There's still things that I say that I wish I didn't say. There's things that I did that I wish I didn't do. There's things that I think that I wish I didn't think. And God is gracious towards me, but God is also incredibly patient for me in his love. So not just love, but also we need patience to forgive one another. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 13 says this. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. If we are going to be a people who forgive one another, and once again, if we're going to have unity, then we have to forgive one another. We have to be patient with each other. So how do those two go together? How does forgiveness and patience go with one another? Well, here's the thing. When we sin, our response to God is to be uh, uh, repentance and confession, asking God to forgive us and to turn from our sin. And God does that, and God does so perfectly. But guess what? In our repentance, we are not perfect. And here's what I mean by that. If I commit a lie and say, I say, God, that was a lie. God, please forgive me for that lie. I repent of that lie. So when I I sin, that means I'm walking towards sin. When I repent, it means I turn the other direction. I start walking back towards God. Well, if my repentance was perfection, then that means I would never tell a lie again after I told one lie. So if I ever tell a lie again, that means I was not perfect in my repentance. Same goes for anger. Same goes for pride. Same goes for selfishness or greed or lust or vanity or any other sin. If I was perfect in my repentance, then there would come a time when I would be perfect on this earth. The Bible is clear that I will not be perfected until I get to heaven. So God in his forgiveness is patient with me, meaning that he forgives me time and time and time again, often for the exact same sin, because I'm imperfect. Now that does not justify my sin, understand. That does not say that I should just be content in my sin, sinning over and over and over again. But there is a reality that we are not perfect even in our confession and even in our repentance. And if it's true of our relationship with God, it's true of our relationship with each other. We have to be patient with each other because you know what? If your husband upset you by what he did or if he sinned against you, chances are he might do it again. If you're someone in the church said something that offended you, there's a chance that it's going to happen again. If your kid disobeyed you and talked back to you, there's a chance it's going to happen again. And we have to forgive each other over and over and over again. Forgiveness is not a one-time thing. Forgiveness is continual. Forgiveness is repeated. And so we have to be patient with one another, forgiving each other over and over and over again because we are not perfect and we mess up. And if we are going to forgive each other, our spouses, our children, our friends, our church family, we have to be patient with each other. Next, patience is needed for us to endure. Sadly, talking about imperfection, we do not live in a perfect world. We live in a world that is fallen, that is messed up because of sin. And we live among imperfection. We live in a world where sin is glorified, where sin is magnified, where sin is praised. And if we are going to live in a world where sin is the status quo, and we are going to do so with love and grace and kindness and compassion, then we have to do so with endurance. And with endurance, we need patience. We endure by focusing on God's promises. The promises that we are his children if we have placed our faith and trust in him. The promise that we have been forgiven. The promise that that we have an eternity with him. The promise that this world is not our home. But what he has for us is something far and infinitely greater. Eternity with him in perfection with no sickness, no sorrow, no sadness, no sin. 
And if we are going to endure, that means we have to patiently wait on God fulfilling His promises. You know, God could have saved us and then immediately took us, taken us home. He could have saved us and then immediately taken us from earth to heaven. But He didn't. He leaves us here so that we can proclaim to the world around us that He is good, so that we can be a light in the darkness, so that we can proclaim the gospel, so that we can show the world that our God is worthy and good of and worthy of our life, and He is gracious and loving and kind, and everyone should turn to Him. So to do that, we have to trust that God is going to fulfill His patient promises. We have to be patient, knowing one day God will make our faith sight. Romans chapter 2, verses 6-7 through seven says this, He will render to each one according to His works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek glory and honor and immortality, He will give eternal life. Romans 8, 25, But if we hope for what we do not see, that's what we do, right? We're hoping for the promises of God. We're hoping for heaven, salvation, eternity. It has been promised to us, but we won't see it until we get to heaven. We wait for it with patience. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance and afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. That's all stuff that Paul has suffered through. By purity, knowledge, patience. Kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love. Paul is saying, look, I have endured these difficulties because of patience. I patiently wait on what God is going to do. I patiently wait on God fulfilling His promises. I patiently wait for God to take me home. And that helps me endure. It helps me endure a world where Christianity is mocked at the Olympics. It helps me endure a world where I'm told that, that my beliefs are, are old-fashioned and out of step. It helps me endure and in love the people who are mocking me because of the promises of God that I'm waiting on patiently. And finally this, patience is needed to fulfill the work God has given us. So in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul is writing Timothy and he gives, he gives Timothy this, this charge and this challenge for him as a pastor. And in fact, this is part of the passage that God used to, uh, to, to kind of place the desire to pastor on my heart. Let me read you 2 Timothy 4 too. It tells him, preach the word. This is what you're called to do. Preach the word. Preach, preach the Bible. Be ready in season and out of season. So always be ready. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. Encourage people, challenge people, present them with scripture, with complete patience and teaching. Paul gives this charge to Timothy that says, hey look, care for God's sheep, love God's people, proclaim to them the word of God, that they would be challenged with their sin and challenged to love God and encouraged in their faith and to do so with patience. If a pastor does not have patience, then they're going to quit. Because it takes time to see God work in lives. It takes time to see God change hearts. It takes time sometimes to see God, to see people kind of see God for who He really is. And to be captivated and love Him. And look, that's not just true of non-pastors, that's true of pastors as well, but if a pastor cannot be patient, then they'll get frustrated and they'll get tired and they'll say, well, what's the point? And Paul says, look, as you preach the word in faithfulness, also do so patiently, knowing that God is at work even if you don't see it. But just so we don't think that it's pastors who have to be patient, let me read you from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. Here Paul's giving a charge and a challenge to the church as a whole. And he says, we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle. So encourage those who are just kind of stuck. Encourage the faint-hearted, those who are giving up. Help the weak. Be patient with them all. God has called us to love each other. God has called us to be a family. God has called us to 
to share each other's burdens, to bear with one another uh, with love, to, to encourage each other when we're getting weak, when we're falling by the wayside, when we're struggling with sin, when we're struggling with our own imperfections and frailties. God says, do so with patience. Be patient with each other. God has called us together, and if we're going to be unified, if we're going to love one another, if we're going to be a church the way God has called us to be a church, we have to do so with patience. Look, we have to be patient with those outside of the church as well. God has called us to love those outside of the church by proclaiming the gospel. Chances are, if you share the gospel with a neighbor one time, they might not accept Christ. I went to church from the time I was really a newborn. Let's just say like 10 when I could really understand, or say 5 when I could kind of understand things. And I didn't accept Christ till I was 15. At least once a week for 10 years, I heard the gospel. I'm going to let you all do the math to figure out how many times that was. But we have to be patient as we proclaim the gospel to other people. We have to be patient as we invite people to church. It might take one invite. It might take two or three or four or ten or twenty or a hundred. Who knows? It doesn't mean that we quit loving people. It might take multiple times of sharing the gospel with someone. It might take years of us praying for someone. If they ever accept Christ, for them to accept Christ. We have to be patient. Patience and endurance might not be the most fun things in life, but they are necessary. And not only are they necessary, but they are good. Patience creates healthy marriages. Patience creates loving parents. Patience creates unity within a church. Patience is not something that we should run or fear, but patience is something we should pray for every single day. Because we need it in order to walk with God and to love each other. So should we as Christians pray for patience? Absolutely. Because it is good and it is needed. If we do so, is it possible that God will put us in situations where we have to live out that patience? Sure. Is it possible that God's going to do that whether we pray for patience or not? Absolutely. So let us set our hearts to love the things that God loves, to love the things that God calls good, and pursue them with all that we are. Patience being one of them.